So for today, we're looking at this message entitled, The Lord Comes to His Temple. And I th I'm sure you guys are familiar with this passage. Um, it's a very famous one that I think you all know. Um, but as we look at this, we're looking at mainly the corruption that comes to the temple. Um, and it's the same corruption that comes to many churches. And so it's important to reflect on these things because the church itself, using that word reflection again, the church itself is a reflection of society and vice versa. And what I mean by that is if it is a healthy church in a community that's doing well, that community will be representative of that church. Um, things will be healthy in that community. Things will be going well. But if that church is corrupted, if it's unhealthy, if there's a lot of problems in the church, a lot of fightings, that will ultimately be representative of the society that it is in. Because what is the church? It is made up of people. <laughs> and those people make up society. And those people are attending that church, right? Um, and so this is very important. Because if you look at places where there are no churches, where the churches are dying out, you know, I read... Um, this week in the news that within the next 40 years, by 2070, Christianity will become a minority religion, actually. That's how much people are leaving the churches and how much things are changing. If you just look at America, you could see what the result of that is, many places in the world. So it's important to understand the corruption in the church and how this can happen. This isn't something new. Uh, this has been happening from the beginning. If you look at the original kind of church in its form when it was Israel traveling through the wilderness and afterwards, you see a time during Samuel's life. When Samuel was born, it was a time of church corruption. At that time, it was after the time of Moses, after the time of the tabernacle was already established. We see this time after judges when people were basically doing whatever they wanted all the time. Right? There was no king, there was no ruler, and people did however they felt. And so the church, which was the tabernacle where people came to worship, that too had become corrupted as well. We see the sons of Eli that were working in that tabernacle, giving up the offering to God. What were they actually doing? Well, though they were married, <laughs> they were sleeping with the women that actually worked at the tabernacle, worked at that temple. They were having affairs. And when key people came to bring their offerings to them, they would take the best portion of that offering, you know, the best part of the meat for themselves, and offer up kind of like the trash that was left over to God. They're basically extorting people for the best things and using people. There's an age of church corruption, if you think about it. And that's why when Samuel came, he came not only to reform the church, but to reform the people. Why? Because the people were a reflection of what the tabernacle had become. That was that period. And today we're looking at the temple period when Jesus is kind of doing the same thing. But this is something that happens again and again, even later. If you look at the New Testament, if you look at the church of Corinth, it's known as a very kind of problematic church. There's a lot of fighting, a lot of issues with pride, showing off. There's a lot of sexual immorality. Why? Well, look at the culture they're in. The culture had seeped into the church. So there's many problems and corruption there. We see later, if you study the history of Christianity, if you look at the Catholic Church, especially after you know, Rome had declared Christianity throughout the region, if you look at the Catholic Church during the Dark Ages, why was it so dark? Because even the Christian Church, the Catholic Church, had become corrupted. You know, we have the Pope, and you have these bishops, and people were abusing their positions. They were basically passing on the church's land to their children and things like that. And if you had land, you had power. So it was a, an issue of power conflicts. They were selling indulgences, trying to make money. It was all tied to money and power and selling positions of power. Right? It was very corrupted. Until when? Or the 1500s, we have the time of Reformation. That was like that Samuel movement again, where it's time to kind of cleanse and restore things. And even today, we see there are many problems also within many churches. 
And if you look at the news, you see there's corruption. You see tied to finances. There's also, you know, sexual immorality. A lot of abuses in the church. My point is, what is needed is reformation, is reform to these places. And that's what we're looking at today. How sometimes when it becomes really corrupt, you need that time of cleansing and restoration. And that's what we see clearly here. It's clearing out that temple, a cleansing of the temple. Why? To return it to its original intent and purpose. And so this is what we're looking at today. And the first point we're going to look at is the Lord comes to his temple. The Lord comes to his temple. And this is also the title of the message because it's interesting. God always works by his word, always by prophecy and fulfillment. And to really understand why Jesus is clearing this temple, what significance it has, you actually have to go back to the Old Testament, to the prophecy tied to it. And this is something I, too, discovered as I was preparing this message, really this background within the Old Testament of prophecy tied to this passage. And that's what I want to look at together with you to really understand what's going on here, God's plan and his purpose here. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, the last prophecy. It's a book we actually looked at many times before because Malachi has prophecies tied to even the transfiguration of Jesus, even the coming of John the Baptist. And we see even here in Malachi, it's even tied to the temple cleansing. So if you have your Bibles, look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Okay, this is speaking of John the Baptist, the Elijah figure that would make way for Jesus Christ to come. And then regarding Jesus and his temple, look at the second sentence. Malachi 3, verse 1, second sentence. It says, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. So we see in the Old Testament, there was going to be someone that would prepare the way, and then the Lord would come, where? To his temple, a messenger of the covenant. This is Jesus Christ, the Lord coming to his temple. And he is the messenger of what? The new covenant. Not saved by the law, but saved by grace. And what follows that is important. What does it say he will do? In Malachi chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. So it's alluding to kind of like this fear, kind of this judgment that will come with him. It says in verse 3, He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. It says he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and gold, right? So if you don't know about this, how is gold and silver purified? Well, gold and silver, it has a lot of impurities in the metal usually. So how do you get out all those impurities to make it shine, to make it look really nice and beautiful and be pure gold? You have to apply an intense heat to it, a very extreme intense heat. And when you apply that, all the impurities, they kind of float to the surface and they're scraped away and scraped off. And what's left behind is just that pure, clean gold. That is what this is talking about, this purification coming. To who? It says the sons of Levi. So if you don't know, Levi is the priestly class in charge of the temple. So there's a purification coming to this priestly class that's in charge of the temple, basically the leaders of the temple. And it's tied to ultimately an incorrect offering that is given to God. 
And it says in verse 4, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be a pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. So what do we see here? The Lord is going to come, refine the sons of Levi, refining the offering, the people. Why? It's all about a restoration. It points to the restoration, a return to the purpose of things, to how things are meant to be, restoring true offering to God. Well, that's very important. Why? The point is the offerings have become corrupted. The people had become corrupted. The priests had become corrupted. Thus the Lord Jesus would come to change and restore things to how they're meant to be. And thus we see this, this judgment and cleansing of the temple through this passage of the day. And so as we look at this, first we're going to look at it through physical eyes. And then we'll look at the spiritual meaning. And so let's look at it with physical eyes first. So look at the point number two. Point number two is Jesus purifies the temple. Jesus purifies the temple. So now we look at our passage today, John 2. I'm looking at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, we see, in the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Okay. So we have this time period of the Passover, and we see in the courts, in the temple courts, there's all these animals that are being sold and money exchangers sitting at these tables. Now, why is this happening? Well, at this time, we see Passover, it is one of the annual festivals. It's one of the main um, festivals and feasts that they are meant to keep as Jews. And we see at this time, Jews had kind of been spread out throughout the Roman Empire. They're all living in distant lands far away, and they're all coming back to Jerusalem to celebrate this event. Now, of course, if you're traveling long distances, it's very inconvenient to bring all these animals for that offering. So what happens? Well, people see this as an opportunity. <laughs> so what do they do? They have animal dealers. So all these people that are coming, they need to buy a sacrifice to worship God for this festival. And so these animal dealers, they see this as an opportunity to make money, to profit, right? It's like, it's like if you're kind of driving for a long time and you need gas, and there's only one gas station, and it has outrageous prices. You don't have a choice but to pay that. Why? Because you need gas right then, right there. That's what's happening now. It's an opportunity to make money. So they're selling these animals to people for profit. And then you have the money changers. They're also needed. Why? Well, if you're traveling from a different country, you have a different currency. You've got to change it into the currency that the Jews will accept at the temple. So you've got to change over your money for that, for the buying of the animal sacrifice, and then also to pay the temple tax which is required for the men. But that too, opportunity. <laughs> They're making money off these exchanges, right? They can charge a lot, maybe keep a little for themselves as well. Pocket the profits, right? So you see, these things are kind of going on at the temple. And it all became an opportunity to exploit the people. And so what has the temple become? The temple has become a marketplace. The temple has become a place of ex exploitation. And one of the worst things is tied to the location. They had corrupted the outer courtyard. The outer courtyard was the only place that the Gentiles could come and pray. They weren't allowed into the inner courts. And so this place where only the Gentiles could pray, that had become a marketplace. So this ultimately, it corrupts the holiness of such a place. Why? The temple is dedicated to worship this holy God. But it's been corrupted. Thus, the Lord comes to his temple. And he comes to purify it. You know, this is the one of the few places where you actually see Jesus getting angry. 
You know, you don't see it really ever except when he's zealous for the things of God. It's a righteous anger because he's come to this place, this corrupted place that's for sacred worship to God the Father, and it is corrupted. So what does he do? If you look at verse 14, it says he makes a whip. He ties these cords together, makes a whip, and he drives out the people. He drives out the animals. He pours out and scatters all the coins of the money changers, and he overturns, flipping over their tables. Jesus is purifying the temple, cleansing it in order to restore it. He says in verse 16, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. The purpose and point of the temple was lost. In another passage, Matthew 21, verse 13, he says of a similar cleansing, he says, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. That's what the temple had become. So Jesus is coming to restore the temple to what it should be, a place of worship to God, a place of fellowship, a place of prayer. It's refining, purifying, cleansing to restore the original purpose of the temple. Okay, that's kind of the physical understanding we have to understand. Now, in the third point, we're looking at this spiritual understanding, looking at this with spiritual eyes. The third point is the Lord purifies you. The Lord Jesus purifies you. Why did they come to the temple? Why did they come to the tabernacle when wandering through the desert? Because that was the dwelling place of God. His seat was sitting there in the Holy of Holies above the ark. That is where people came to fellowship with God, to worship him. Why? The temple was his dwelling place. That's the Old Testament. But now on this side of the cross, what is the temple now? 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you are God's temple? You are God's temple, and God's spirit dwells in you. You are the temple. Now with that, reflect back on this passage again. We are the temple. We are corrupted. We are defiled. We are unrighteous in God's sight. Our lives are caught up all about how we could just benefit ourselves. We trade our lives, our health, everything for profit, for opportunity. We live for these worldly pleasures and desires. We're very self-centered, self-focused, and not God-centered, just like the temple had become. But now Christ comes into your life. You're saved. You're born again. And now, just as Malachi wrote, he came, why? To refine you as he refines gold. To purify you of all your sins and unrighteousness. To cleanse you with the fuller soap. This cleansing is through the Holy Spirit's work in you. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. It is cleansing you of your unrighteousness, making you new. That's what it means to be born again. That's what it means for sanctification. It's making you holy, cleansing you. And what's interesting is we look at this cleansing of the temple in John 2. How does that happen to us? Through the Holy Spirit. What follows John chapter 2? In John chapter 3, Jesus actually meets with the Pharisee talking about what? To see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. It's following closely to this whole temple incident is the coming of the Holy Spirit because that's what's doing this work of making you righteous, reforming you, restoring you to how you're meant to be. 
And just as Jesus came with that whip, Jesus Christ comes into your life, into your heart, driving out Satan's authority and his power that he holds over you, all that authority. You are set free from Satan just as Jesus drives out the corrupt things from the temple. For so long, Satan has sat on the throne of your life, and now he is cast out. Your whole world was centered on yourself, on money, on pride. Your whole life, when you enter into Christ, it becomes turned upside down, just like the money changers' tables. Your whole life changes in Christ. You have a new master, a new Lord. Why? Just like we talked about from the introduction and again and again, it is to restore you for restoration to your intended purpose in creation. Just like the temple had an intended purpose, we were created with a purpose to serve and glorify God with our lives. That is a part of our design, the intent. And now that Christ has come into your life that is restored so you can glorify God, so you can offer up the correct offering, the correct offering that is pleasing to the Lord. One of my favorite verses tied to this is Romans 12, verse 1. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says, In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's not about giving that offering anymore. Why? We're saved by faith. So our life becomes a living offering. And what does it say? An offering that is pleasing to God. That's exactly what it says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 4. It says, the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be a pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old. So it's a restoration. And just as it says in Romans 12, verse 2, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The temple was conforming to the pattern of the world. That's how it became corrupted. It was made into a business, which happened in the past, which happens even now. Churches can become that way as well. Conforming to the pattern of this world, becoming a business. There's many that even come to church, that come to church for the sole purpose of networking. <laughs> I know people that were trying to do a business and they came to the church, so like, oh, I can make a lot of money doing this and that. And that's why some people come. That is not the purpose of church. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That reformation and renewing comes by the Holy Spirit in you. The point is the Lord has come to his temple. The Lord has come to you to be in you and with you. And now what do you do? All you have to do is enjoy that each and every day. Enjoy Emmanuel. Your true offering of worship is just that fellowship with God, spending time in the word and prayer, worship to God every day. And if you do that, as you're enjoying Emmanuel, you will live a life that reflects the glory of God. And that is my desire for you. And finally, in conclusion, once again, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says, the Lord who you seek will come to his temple. So actually, the Lord God, God is revealed kind of in three ways through this passage. And that's why I close with you together, going through these ways that the Lord is revealed. How is the Lord revealed in this passage. Well, first we see it through his zeal. His zeal. It says in John 2.17, after he clears out the temple, it says his disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. They're remembering a passage in Psalm 69 tied to David. David was actually ridiculed for this. David said, for zeal for your house has consumed me. David had a heart after God's. 
He had this zeal, this passion, this great love and joy for God and his temple. And Jesus has that as well, zeal for the temple. And so when they see Jesus, they see his zeal for the temple and how he's driving out these money changers and animal dealers. They see that, and they see a reflection of David, who had that same passion. So he embodies that Davidic king they were waiting for. It's a picture of the Messiah they were waiting. That's the first way he's revealed. The second way is what comes later. And we didn't read this, but it comes after this, in chapter 2, verse 18. It's tied to his power over death. It says in verse 18, So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? So they were curious. What authority do you have to do what you're doing? To flip over these tables, to cast everyone out. How can you do this? You're just a person, right? What authority do you have? What is a sign that Jesus gives them? In verse 19, Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. His sign for his authority to do these things is tied to the prophecy of his death and resurrection. Because he died and resurrection, it means that he is who he says he is. And this is very important regarding Jesus. You can have any view you want of Jesus, but the only valid one is based on the evidence of the truth. If he says he was God, and he did these things with the authority of God, the ability to forgive sins, and if he just died, and that was the end of it, well, he was just another religious leader. Him claiming to be God, well, you could ignore that because he was just a person. But if he died and resurrected, just as he said, if he overcame death, that demonstrates that he is God and that also means everything he said is true. That when he said, I and the Father are one, when I am God, that means even those words are true. And to ignore that is to ignore the evidence and ignore the facts and the truth. And the final reason we see a demonstration that he is the Lord God is what happens in verse 24. It says, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. We see he knows something that only God knows. He knows the hearts of mankind, truly. That's why he never entrusted himself to them. He spent time with them, associated with them, but he was very aware of the heart of mankind and their thoughts. Thus we see in John, again and again, John's point is to reveal Jesus as God. And we see it here in this passage. He revealed it through his zeal for the temple, through his power over death, and through knowing the hearts of all mankind. So from today's passage, we see this is the Lord that was prophesied to come to his temple. First, to cleanse the physical temple of that corruption, and later, he comes to you, to your corrupted body, to purify and cleanse you so that your life may be what? a pleasing offering to God. And so I pray that this is a week. I pray that this week, and bless you, that this week you will live daily with that on your mind, restoring your temple to one that truly glorifies God each and every day. Let's pray together. Dear Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to go through your word together. Father God, we know that we are weak and powerless. But with you in us, Father God, we are made strong. Even our weaknesses are made into strength through your power. So we pray, Father God, just as you cleanse that temple in Jerusalem, we pray that you continue to work by your Holy Spirit to cleanse us, reform us, heal us, change us, so our lives may reflect your beauty and your glory each and every day. Allow us, Father God, to live a life that reflects your glory always. 
We thank you for this time together. We pray this all in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.